Okay, so why don't we start off with uh, Christina? Great. Okay, great. Hey, hey, what's up? So I'm Christina, uh, last semester at the new school. I'm taking this class because uh, apart from it being part of the requirements for the MS degree, I thought it would be really interesting, and it has been. It has been a world of interesting. Great. <laughs> All right, Devin? All right. Um, so, yeah, I'm Devin. I am in, this is my last class to finish my master's in media studies, so I'm real excited. Um, I took this class because I work in social and digital media. I'm an account manager uh, for, well, I was for Disney, but I just transitioned over to SeaWorld, actually. Um, both Christine and I live in Florida, so we can talk about that. But uh, So, yeah, so I thought that this, <laughs> ironically, as we sit on the same couch. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I took it to try to um, to explore kind of, digital uh, education and try to heighten some of my career path. Great, thank you. All right, uh, Emery? Oh, hi, sorry. I was helping Cherry uh, figure out how to sit down. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm a course assistant, and I'm just helping out Josephine in this specific course. I've taken mashup culture with her. I'm an MS um, in media management student and just glad to be a part of um, this class to help out in any way I can. Thanks, Samarine. Um, Danielle? Hi, I'm Danielle. I actually um, live in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, my interest in this class comes from the fact that I um, I do social media for a nonprofit, and so um, that's pretty much my background is in nonprofits. Um, yeah, and I thought, just like everyone else, the class sounded interesting, and I've had a great time so far learning all the different, different types of platforms and things like that. So, yeah, it's been a good mm -hmm. class. Thank you. All right, Brooke, and then Cherry, and then Kim. So, I'm Brooke. I live just north of New York City in Hartsdale, and... Um, I'm taking this class because I'm writing my thesis on how parents use digital uh, technology to create support networks. And I thought network collaboration would be like right up my alley. And it actually turns out I use a lot of this in my job as a communications consultant too. Great, thank you. Okay, Cherry, can you hear us? She might just be able to type, but not sure. Hello, testing. Okay, um, Kim, can you go ahead and we'll uh, catch up with Cherry. Oh, I think Kim's muted because she has her baby with her. Yeah, I think she's just going to be able to do text, so she's probably typing right now. Okay, thanks, Kim. All right, John, do you want to go ahead and tell a bit about your background and uh, what we'll be do doing today? Okay, uh, my name is John Mitchell. I actually teach in a dance program at Arizona State. We recently merged with film and theater, so I teach in the School of Dance I get the name right. Film, dance, and theater. After much debating about the order of the names, <laughs> uh, that's what we came up with. And uh, and I teach like face-to-face -face classes, like with people, you know, 
they're like right in front of me. But I'm also starting to teach a few online classes uh, in the last couple of years. Um, I've been using Second Life in, in my dance and media class for about five years now. And uh, we've done a bunch of performances just uh, dance performances, some of which involve live viewers viewing into Second Life, some of which are only in, take place in Second Life. Uh, I've done conference presentations. We did a piece in Italy. We've I've done pieces in Toronto and oh, um, I don't know, all over the place. Can you hold on one second, John? I feel like Cherry okay. is maybe not hearing us. Okay. Testing, 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 one, two, three. saw her little statement. She touched Yeah, so. yeah. Okay, yeah, just, no, I keep forgetting she can't hear us. Maybe just the volume button. Okay, sorry for the delay, everybody. Just Oops. hold on one second. I'm also recording this on video, so we can have this archived for viewing later, too. Thanks. But in any case, it's nice to oh. see you again, John. <laughs> yeah, it's great to see you. I guess Cherry left. She's, it looks like she poofed out. Yeah, I told her to sign out and in just to see if she could clear okay. out, you know, um, check her sound preferences okay. and clear everything out again. <laughs> and then we have Christine doing backflips. <laughs> okay, great. Did you um, get the note cards that I put in your inventory, John? Um, I did. Okay. Yes. Okay. I didn't look at them, but they're in there. Uh, I'll look at them now. Yeah, it's the one that says animations for net collar class. And oh, I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. We're only going to be... In the email. Exactly. We're only going to be using those, like, I think, eight, you know, or nine um, animations just to make things a little bit simpler and clearer. Yeah. No, that's fine. Yeah. All okay. right, so... All right, so Cherry can hear us. Like Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three, four, testing, 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 testing one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Anything? Anybody? No? I hear you. <laughs> well, we can, yes. <laughs> Okay, um, Emmerine, can you can you help Cherry um, troubleshoot the sound preferences and stuff? Yeah, sure. Okay, I will okay. Try to. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Um, and we'll go ahead. I mean, I'm recording this, so um, she might she might just okay. need to kind of like check not only her sound, second life preferences, but her computer sound preferences too, right. and log out and in again. Sometimes that just you know sometimes it's really just a network thing. Um, but um, I'll go ahead and, and have John um, keep talking because it's um, well, we don't have too much time, so um, we'll go we'll go ahead and John, if you want to, I think you were saying, um, oh, you were talking about the kind of performances, and I think you dropped out a little on the audio. I lost you a little bit, so if you just want to kind of oh, okay. back, yeah. Yeah, watch out for that. All right, so 
so we've done a lot of performances uh, in Second Life over the years. Some have been uh, involving live viewers that could actually even participate with us by because we can stream video in, streaming in live video. We've done actual more or less set pieces in uh, Italy. We did one, and like I say, I've done some in other places. Um, we've done some where we change locations, and this is something that my students actually have done quite a bit of moving from location to location, doing essentially site performances, site uh, movement pieces in the Second Life, finding some interesting locations and using those locations as a creative uh, uh, starting point for a dance, mm -hmm. per se. Um, I think, Josephine, we pioneered this sort of going from uh, animation into dance form, or into, uh, I use dance forms, we're going from animation into Second Life. Uh, by bringing in BVH files, and right? Talk, them. talk talk a little bit about BVH. I mean, um, I don't know if um, how many people are familiar with those files. So, a BVH file is a motion capture file, mm -hmm. and right, it's a BioVision, yeah, yeah, BioVision file. A and so, uh, a lot of what is done to make our avatars move in certain ways is that people upload animations that we then apply to our avatars. Um, so you can also take just motion capture files in general, upload them and create your own animations and um, which John and I have done by using a combination of BVH files and um, also using this program called Dance Forms, but you can also use any 3D program to create yeah. animations. And so one of the things I do in my media class is the students all make dance forms animations and then they upload them to Second Life and combine them into gestures and then they can make relatively complex uh, group dances. And it's really a lot of fun. And like I said, we've been doing that for about five years. I, I don't know how many. I've probably run a couple hundred students through there. Uh, so I've got quite a collection of animations uh, and, uh, and of gestures and of... Uh, dances. Um, so, since it sounds like most people are pretty savvy with um, media, and I, I just want to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about telematics and how uh, I came into Second Life from, from telematic performance. Um, does anyone know what I mean by telematic? Since we're not coming from a, a, a arts area, I'm just trying to check that out. Okay, all right. Um, uh, dance and telematics are basically involve linking re uh, remote sites through through video conferencing, essentially, and audio, so video and audio, uh, to create uh, dance performances. Um, this has a long history, believe it or not. I mean, really starting with. Uh, the analog world and then moving into the digital world. Uh, I think maybe the most famous telematic piece, the first one, was Hole in Space, created by um, the Electronic Cafe uh, out of uh, Santa Monica, California. And Sherry Rabinowitz and her partner uh, essentially somehow co opted some satellite time and they created a uh, took a window at the Broadway store in LA and they created, took a window at the um, uh, in New York uh, and they connected those two places with video with full full size uh, human video and audio and people walking by suddenly looked into LA and if they're in New York and if they're in LA they looked into New York and all of a sudden somebody figured it out what was going on and they called their friends and on the other coast and people that hadn't seen each other in years started going to these locations to see and talk to their family members or whoever it was long lost friends so that was a very became a very famous piece um, moving forward uh, in the analog world it, it got a little bit easier uh, we, we began to be able to send video over phone lines uh, in the late 80s and early 90s with video conferencing types of equipment, which is very expensive and mostly used for uh, businesses to have conferences, uh, you know, across the country or internationally. Um, but these were still all analog devices. And, and does everyone know the difference between analog and digital? Or should I talk about that for a moment? 
I think we're good. We're good. Okay. So, I mean, with analog devices, we're, we're talking about uh, information that we can readily receive in our body because we don't have to have a translator, right? We don't need a computer because it's, it's you know, sound waves and it's light waves and things that we can, we can uh, respond to. But then uh, with the digital, the coming of the Internet and digital revolution, um, all of a sudden as bandwidth got wide enough, we started sending sound over the Internet. That was the first big thing, recording a pianist living in L.A., recording on a recording in New York over the Internet and all this stuff. And eventually video, and now, of course, uh, it's a, it's an everyday thing. You have FaceTime on your phone, which is cellular, which is another whole level. So we've kind of gone from analog to digital to cellular information, which is really the future, I think. And uh, and that the, the sort of digital lines are going to slowly, I think, fade out. And so as we do that, uh, things change. When we move into digital, we have a computer that's encoding and decoding that information, and it's not the same that as we send. Now, the better it is, uh, the less that we notice the difference, but also we get used to the difference. And so we're talking about uh, information that's not as human. And, and this is the information we see all the time today. So it's kind of something to just kind of keep in mind that, that uh, it's all compressed and it's all encoded. And, and that's a, it's a cultural uh, there are cultural implications. It's a, it's a cultural choice. Somebody made that encoding. Someone made that device that changes that information from one form to another and back. And it's embedded with their biases, you know. And I think that that's uh, something that the information countries sort of push out onto the rest of the world. All right. That's my political statement. <laughs> All right, so so uh, in about uh, 2000, we, we created this, this group called ADAPT, Association for Dance and Performance Telematics. And we had five universities that were all on fast internet then. It was called Internet 2, fast enough for video. And uh, it seems hard to think that that was 13 years ago, but... Um, you couldn't really send video over regular internet. It was too slow. So um, we started doing research in, in the, the kind of dramaturgy and the technical challenges and the process of linking remote sites. What happens? What can you do? What's, what are the opportunities? What are things that you can do that you can't do in a regular performance? And we had a, a, a few conferences like that. Josephine, you attended one of those, didn't you? Yeah, it was before we started working with the ADAPT stuff. It was, a, it was the SWIPT conference or something like that. It was SWIPT, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we had cell bytes. We had a couple of SWIPT. So we were doing these summer conferences where we were linking spaces on, on our campus. I'm at Arizona State in Tempe. And uh, it was a great little workshop to kind of get familiar with you know what happens what what happens when things don't work how do you make something you know with someone that you uh, how do you stage manage it how do you get how do you start at the same time how do you end at the same time what happens if there's a problem at one end or the other so eventually we got pretty good at this and and it became pretty popular around the world and and we started doing other um linking up with countries and other continents and Josephine, you're at, at the Vogue, right? And we, we did a piece with you uh, from Tempe to Amsterdam with yes. the moderator mm -hmm. in London. So we linked three countries on different continents. And uh, after that, I did a, a, a large-scale piece with a group out of Seville, Spain, called uh, Proyecto Paso, which was based on the um, 30 articles of the United Nations uh, Declaration of Human Rights. And this piece, we linked South America, uh, a group, uh, Ivani Santana in San Salvador, Brazil, with uh, Seville, Spain, with Tempe, and eventually we added a partner from Chile. And so here we are linking three continents, doing these works for, for public as well. In Seville, it was a public presentation. We were sending video streams back and forth to each other, mixing them in one place, sending them back out. Um, 
with large casts at each site, you know, maybe 10, 15 dancers. Uh, so it was pretty intense and, and rewarding. And, and this piece ran, we did three, three different shows over a period of about two years. Um, and it was pretty successful. Uh, but what really happens at the end of the day is, is that video feed provides you with the window on the world. So at, when, you're, when you're performing, all you see is what the other side wants you to see, right? You don't know what's going on behind the scenes. You don't know uh, anything except what, what they choose to show you. And um, this kind of became a segue into Second Life because what happens in Second Life is, um, uh, yeah, what happens things always don't work. Well, what we end up doing was stage managing over chat. So we had uh, a person at each site that was on chat, that was on headphones, headset, that could talk to the stage. And, you know, it, with the, the Periacto Passel, uh, there are 30 articles of human rights, and we did a three-minute vignette on each one in each site, and we performed those vignettes together, and then they were mixed together. So we had a 90-minute piece consisting of 33-minute pieces. It was very time-intensive. <laughs> Once it started running, it just ran, and if you missed your piece, you just went on to the next one. You know, you couldn't uh, go back. You couldn't stop. Uh, there are live audiences, you know, at all the sites. Um, but it actually went pretty well, um, and we had interactive sound at our site, interactive sound in Spain, so that's really my background is an in interactive performance. So, uh, Can you, um, John, talk a little bit about, I mean, so there's all this history of telematic, you know, collaboration from analog to digital and now cellular, um, and, the, and, and very much the way that you know, dance has been a part of it, and performance has very much changed because because of that. Like, can you talk a little bit about the kinds of interactions that are now possible that weren't possible before, and just kind of how that kind of collaboration has progressed? Oh well, sure. I mean, I think now um, this the screen becomes a window on the world, and we accept that when we see it, if it's used on the stage, you know, we see it as a I mean, I have students that do work where they shoot video uh, and then they interact with it in a, in a live performance where they actually walk into the screen. So, so it looks like they're walking into the screen, but they've planned it out so that they're actually walking into another location. So it's kind of like uh, Doctor Who, you know, he goes, he goes into different places uh, with his little time machine. So they, they can walk from the stage into the screen, they can that have this pre-recorded video, and, and we accept that as they're walking into another location, you know, uh, and it's, it's strange in some ways that we accept that because that's just a screen and it's flat and it's not three-dimensional, but we, we become so screen savvy that um, there's lots of sort of uh, uh, cultural references that we take for granted and we just, you know, accept them and we don't question them. Um, kind of interactions we did with, with Paso, uh, we all, each actually created our own pieces, and they were just kind of mixed together in Spain. But things we did with, with uh, when you were at the Vogue was we played an online, uh, online game over distance. So it was, a, it was a game played by two people in Amsterdam and two people in Tempe, and they had these, this goal to try and uh, move on the same squares at the same time. And so that was much, that was for me much more interesting because there was real interaction uh, across, you know, whatever, 5,000 miles in real time. And so, you know, uh, the world becomes smaller. We connect uh, with, you know, eight hours to Europe, eight hours uh, the other way, or 12 hours the other way to Japan. So when we rehearse, we have someone always up in the middle of the night because that's just the way the world the world is. Um, yeah, I remember that. I was like, because of the time difference, you know, in, in Arizona and the time difference in Amsterdam, and then there was also daylight savings time. It was always like one in the morning when I was rehearsing with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because we could only get space at certain times, yeah. And so we have rehearsal, you know, rehearsal considerations. 
And then we had Johannes, we remember, in England. Right. He was moderating. Oh, yeah. So he's in, he's in another place, and he's kind of like the game show host. And he's looking on both streams, and he's uh, adding commentary, you know, in real time. So so what we have is, is we have, you know, multiple sites with windows on each other's site. And, and we choose to interact uh, through those sites. And maybe we should show it. would be a good time to show my video clip. Sure. Show it? Just let me let me put it on the screen. Give me a second. Okay. Because this is a piece called uh, Monday Night Live. It was kind of taken off on Monday Night Football. But it was a, basically a birthday party interactive telematic event between Tempe, Ohio State, University of Wisconsin, Madison, and University of Utah. And it's just part of that. It's only about three and a half minutes. It might help to have a little visual. Arizona State the University bought an island Second Life. And Josephine, you'd already been working in Second Life. And you had your, your space, right. this, the theater built, and we moved it over and um, began experimenting uh, with, with students from, from Arizona State uh, in Second Life. And um, 
for me, what connects this to, to, to the telematic performance is in the telematic performance, you have the kind of the window on the world, and then you're looking through that window, uh, the camera, you're looking into that space, and then you're meeting people in that space, but only in that window. In Second Life, you have a, a basically a virtual location that everyone can go to, and so it's kind of like the inverse. You don't see the world at all, but you, you meet everyone in this virtual location, but you still have all the time constraints and all the other logistical issues, but at least you have, and you have an avatar. And avatars are interesting, and they have a whole set of cultural uh, connotations. Uh, I don't know if I'm, you probably have talked about those already, haven't you, Josephine? Actually, not too much. We haven't talked about, we've met inside Second Life a couple of times and experimented with some of the dance gestures and whatnot, but we haven't gotten to any really sort of like granular discussions around like avatars or embodiment or anything like that quite yet. Okay. It's, it's interesting in my class, uh, like I say, I've taught this for, uh, I've taught my uh, part of my class in Second Life for about five years, and that's about 10 classes. And um, I always have students that are really, really opposed to Second Life. And I always have students that really, really love it. And so why do you think that is? Anyone? Well, Any I'll go ahead and say that I'm against Second Life. I'm not a fan of it. I think that it's not a very good... Um, it doesn't work very well. Uh -huh. um, I mean, like, even now I can see, like, my hair. I have bald spots and stuff like that. And, you know, we have all of these technical difficulties, and I'd much rather have a face-to-face -face conversation than hang out in Second Life. I mean, I'd okay. much, much rather do, like, Google Hangout or something like that. Right, right. Okay. Well, I think um, to speak to totally, just really specifically to that point, Brooke, um, I think that, well, firstly, like, I don't know that I would ever compare, like, face-to-face -to, -face to Second Life because I think that's just apples and oranges, and they're very, very different interactions that, you know, aren't really meant to be compared. They're just, you know, um, they're different interactions um, that we have to sort of learn to work within because, you know, they have different affordances. But I think that some of the dance games that we'll do today really speak towards leveraging the space towards what it can be capable of, you know, so, which is that, you know, yes, there are certainly, my goodness, like the, you know, the graphics engine and things like that certainly could be better. Um, and, you know, um, the graphics engine in Unity is certainly um, better. And But, um, like, as a collaboration platform, it's actually one of the most open, like, you can customize it more than any other virtual world. Um, and up until very, just recently, all the content you created was completely, you know, owned and licensed by, by you. But, but really, I think for me and for John as well, it's that you can customize all of your avatar motions, you can customize the way that you look, the way that your entire environment looks. And, and that can't be said with um, even a lot of games, you know, where you can make maps, but no. they're very, very, like, restricted in terms of, like, what right. the maps ha need to look like and also what kinds of objects you can make. So I just think it's about, like, sort of understanding, like, kind of the affordances that each platform or service can offer and can and try to trying to make kind of interesting collaborative frameworks around that, so to speak. Well, maybe we could hear from someone that that uh, likes Second Life or enjoys it, and maybe they want to speak to the positive side of it. I have to say, I'm always surprised that I have students that that are sort of they 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 do the Second Life exercise because it's part of the class for a grade, but they don't want to do it. Hmm. Uh, anyone want to speak to yeah. the plus the pluses? Well, I can. Cherry's I mean, Cherry's typing something. Okay, great. Okay, she loves it. <laughs> oh, really? Interesting. Okay.
<laughs> yeah, you can't touch everything. That's true. And I think, too, um, I'll just say this while Cherry is typing, too. Um, I think that, you know, I mean, this particular virtual world is certainly not the end-all, be-all. I think that there will be many, you know, iterations of virtual worlds, and this is just one of them. Um, we've had meta plays, we've had, you know, small world and things like that. And, you know, I think that we're still sort of discovering sort of what what works, you know, well in a virtual world and, you know, what, you know, how to really like, you know, make it um, adapt to, to what we need it to be. And I think that this is just one of the very first iterations that still, you know, renders it a little bit clunky and, you know, and, a little, um, you know, there are some issues, but I think that also, you know, like as we move through and use different kinds of engines and there's better, you know, like less lag and, you know, better graphics and things like that, um, this will really like open up the possibilities. But, you know, I'm not particularly married to Second Life, you know, in particular. Um, but again, I think it's really about like how much we can customize it. No, I, 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 but I still, what, what's interesting to me socially is that I've got, in my students, I have these two camps. One camp that I have certain students that just fall in love with Second Life. And when I come in to class, they're, they're in there early and they're in Second Life and they're experimenting around, you know, looking for places. They have another set that doesn't want to go near it. So I just find that from a cultural standpoint, extremely interesting and it just uh, it shows the diversity of people and interests. Um, I'm not really ready to, to defend Second Life. I don't think there's yeah. anything to defend. I think. But at the same time, um, as Cherry said, there is so much here. I've had students search for locations. You know, they go on the space station. They <laughs> students go to Michael Jackson Neverland Ranch. They go to there's Alice in Wonderland. There's you know there's all these uh, really a, a relatively intricate. Uh, reconstructions of, of sort of famous places and um, you can go to different countries where people are in that are from, uh, when we we're in Italy people it was Italian people spoke Italian you had to speak Italian to talk to anybody I mean the fact that you can go all around the world is, is really fascinating yeah yeah and I, I feel like yeah and I, I, I want to say the same thing too like it's not really about defending Second Life it's just about sort of like um, you know, understanding what's possible. And I think that the language thing is like a big component of it, like, you know, learning language inside here. So because it's like a really yeah. good, it's like a real, it's a, the community um, is really big and you can learn a language fairly easily here. And that could augment maybe like a course in blended reality. Um, no, no, no. I, I think you know? that that's, that's very true. Yeah. And so, um, and so there's also the, the notion of um, gaming culture. Yeah. And that, some people are opposed to games, and I, I tend to think that the people that don't like game, uh, video games, uh, don't like Second Life, and that's just uh, that's a very broad generalization. But I think there's a correlation, at least, between video games and interest in Second Life. I'm glad you brought up games, actually, because this world makes me think of Minecraft. I like the fact that you guys can build structures and things like that. What you don't get from Minecraft, obviously, is this interaction with other individuals, and you can speak with them. Um, but being able to build like what Josephine has here, that's actually pretty incredible. I'll piggyback on what Christina was saying, too. Is I, I think that has to do a lot with the societal outlook of Second Life right now, is that it, it I think it's seen in association with the gaming culture because of the avatars, because of, of you know, maybe it was prevalent there first, but I think it, it carries a stigma because of that. You know, I, I think it's kind of just social, social transitions between um, on how we represent ourselves. Like right now it's okay to spend your whole day on Facebook and post, you know, everything you ate to Instagram, but there's still some kind of... Um, social negativity or outlook to, you know, uh, connecting and, you know, from a wide standpoint, because I think 
it is right now so associated with that kind of gamer mentality. Like, I don't think it would be a far stretch right now for people to say, like, Minecraft, World of World Class, Dungeons and Dragons, Second Life. You know, like, and yeah. but I think oh, that'll yeah. change. Yeah, and, and I know? think there's very much like that, um, so there's very much in Minecraft the same sort of, like, creating, creative community. Like, you know, I forget who was, like, the, like people create, like, entire... Um, campuses on Minecraft, uh, and you know it just has a different sort of like building structure, but like, it's the same sort of originality and almost like entrepreneurial mindset. But I, w- I want to speak towards something that um, I think Cherry had brought up a little bit earlier here, which was the refugee kids. And um, I believe you were were you talking about the working with the uh, Macondo Dance Connect uh, kids? I think it was, um, but I'll, I'll speak towards that anyway because I feel like, oh, maybe it was something different. Um, but uh, I actually also worked with a group of refugee kids in Vienna in a refugee community called the Macondo. And the thing that we experimented with with them, which I think that you can do in here that's very hard to do in other kinds of platforms, is that we did identity role play. So it was this idea of using avatars to explore different kinds of cultural identities. So we asked the kids, and I, and I actually I did it several times in a couple of Kids Connect programs, but uh, you know you can change your avatar to look however you want it to look. So we actually asked the kids to first make an avatar that looked like themselves, which usually happens because that's what we're familiar with. We want an avatar that looks like ourselves, or you know something close to it. We asked them to make a second avatar that looked nothing like themselves. So you know maybe it's a oh, bigger or yeah. shorter right you know avatar yeah. one that has a you know yeah. uh, you know it's a giant has a big belly has leopard you know skin or blue skin or just dark skin or light skin but it has to be different from the avatar i mean the, the avatar that's yourself the your physical self you know and then so we asked them to be this sort of opposite or other avatar uh, for an entire session and they had to go someplace else, and they had to interact with other people and other avatars as this other sort of opposite, you know, avatar. And it was interesting because, you know, one of the girls, like, she she was like 12 or 13. She didn't want to be a different avatar. She only wanted to be like this kind of, she had made like this very sexy, buxom avatar for herself. Interesting. And it was very yeah. pretty, you know. And she, well, she... She only wanted to be the pretty svelte avatar, you know, and it wasn't until like the third or fourth day that she felt, I guess, kind of safe enough to like experiment with being a different kind of avatar, which was interesting, you know, and, um, and I think that those interactions of like being this other kind of avatar, like being, you know, dark instead of light or light instead of dark and, you know, fat instead of skinny and, you know, whatever, you know, um, that really, I think it sticks with you that it, even though it's in this virtual world, those are sort of like real, you know, after effects oh, no. that happen. No, they are. And yeah, yeah it's like I, yeah, I, I think, empathy theater. I, yeah, that's exactly what I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's, there, there's two things, you know, Second Life kind of comes out of the chat room world in a way, you know. So there's that, there's the notions of anonymity and about uh, you can be whatever you want to be and, and all that. And then, but it's connected still to the real world. There are real world aspects in Second Life that that you cannot escape. Uh, for for instance, uh, when my students would do uh, performances in different places, they'd often get kicked out because the the people that owned that site didn't want them dancing like that in that space, which seems really strange. But yeah, that happens. I mean, we, we, I've had that happen to me uh, when I was in performing in a place in Mexico. Um, I guess maybe it was a sacred temple. I don't know. Maybe I was I was broaching a cultural taboo that I didn't know about. But yeah, I got and when when, when they kicked me out, I w- I was like we would be like thrown into this vortex where we would just fall forever, you know. And <laughs> we'd have to reboot. <laughs> uh, and so you know, it's a very real world thing. Someone owns that. And, and it's theirs, and you have to abide by their rules. Yeah, yeah. So why don't we just take this moment to, let's stand up, and I'll take these couches away, and we'll start doing one of the dance games, and we'll start off with doing a okay. mirroring game, just to get everyone reacquainted.
Okay, so let me just get rid of these couches, put them away. And then if everyone can open up their inventory, command I on a Mac or control I on a PC. And if you'll go to your, I believe it's probably your gestures folder for some of you, like for, you know, um, for us, it's actually our animations folder, but in your gestures folder, you'll have the animations in there. And again, the way that you trigger them is to type the name of the gesture into the chat box. So for D1, it's just slash D1 into the chat box. For matrix, it's slash matrix, etc. So the ones that we have are, yeah, exactly. Um, the ones that we have are D1, Exorcist, Matrix, Backflip, Kata 1, Kata 2, and Kata 3. And I'm going to copy these into the chat box. Okay, so, <clears throat> so we have all of those. So go ahead, if you haven't gone through all of them, go ahead and go through all of them. The D1, Exorcist, Matrix, Backflip, Cut to 1, Cut to 2, and Cut to 3. Note that those all play through once, right? So when you do each of them, it just plays through once, and then it stops. Then there are the ones that are looped. And uh, over here we have uh, um, your, uh, Christina's doing Jelly. And that one is actually looped. So of the ones that are looped, we have jelly and spin. And you'll note that you have to start and stop those because those are looped. And they'll play forever until you stop them. Is that like a random in... Oh, never mind. Okay, so go ahead and uh, if you've gone through D1, Exorcist, Matrix, Backflip, Cut to 1, Cut to 2, and Cut to 3, now go through the looped ones, the looped ones, which are Spin Start, Spin Stop, and Jelly Start, Jelly Stop. Okay, so everyone do Jelly now. So again, it's just going to be slash jelly underscore start to start it and slash jelly underscore stop to stop it. Okay, it looks like it had everyone has got jelly. All right. And yeah, let's go ahead and stop that and then start the spin. Great. Note that with the spin, again, this is looped, so it's going to keep going until you stop it. With the spin, you can also layer movements on top of that, right? So if I did kata 3 with this, go ahead and see what happens. You'll keep spinning, and you'll do kata, the kata 3 with it, but 
you'll go into these kicks while you're going into the spin. It's sort of an interesting layer. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and stop that, stop the spin. So slash spin underscore stop. Okay. And then there are freezes. There are two freezes. And these are looped gestures also. So you're going to stay frozen until you unfreeze yourself. So the first one is freeze one underscore start. So it's slash freeze one underscore start. Yep, there you go. And then let's unfreeze this. So this is slash freeze one underscore stop. And then there's freeze two. So that would be flash slash freeze two underscore start. Welcome back, John. We're just doing the freezes. Great. So this one's like a little bit more of a Saturday Night Live type of freeze, where the other one's kind of boxy. Okay. So we'll unfreeze this one. Okay. And last but not least is the very last thing which ends the game, which is the sleeping pose, which is sleep underscore start. And you literally just fall down dead sleep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good. Now, note also that you can do any of these things in the air, too, because, of course, we're not restricted by gravity in here, right? So, like, if I were to go ahead and go into a fly, I could do that, right? So go ahead and stay sleeping and just go ahead and fly while you're in this sleeping pose. And, again, you can go above somebody. You can page up and go a little bit higher, page down a little bit a little lower, move yourself in space, <laughs> bump into people, um, so you can do any of these dance gestures in a different space. By placing yourself in a different space, by flying there, you can go above somebody, below somebody. Like There are different spatial options that you can take with all of these different things. Okay, so let's go ahead and come out of our sleep. Sleep stop, or sleep underscore stop, yeah. Josephine, did you share these gestures with me? Yeah, it's in the note card, in the animations for Net Collab note card. So how do I get how do I get those into my gesture folder? Because they're not working. Uh, you just need to um, cl click on them and copy them into your inventory, and then activate them. I'm sure you already have them. These are the okay. ones that we've used before, but they're just yeah, probably they're I rena name. yeah I renamed them I renamed them name. yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's try this. Okay, so I'll go ahead and do a gesture, and you guys have to do it with me. And uh, this requires just like sort of knowing a little bit which gesture is which, um, but they're all pretty clear if, if you do them just a couple of times. Okay, all right. So I'll go ahead and start. Great. Good, yeah, so this is D1. Good. Next. This is one of the freezes. Good. Good. 
Almost, Christina. It's the other one. Yep. Good. Okay. This is a good one. John, did you get them into your inventory? I'm working on it. Okay. I have to activate them. Okay. Okay, so now that we've gone through all of them and I basically led the little mirroring game, let's expand it a little bit. So instead of me being the leader in the mirroring game, anyone can be a leader, okay? So we just have to watch whoever like makes the first change, you know, can happen just organically, but you can do one of the freezes, you can do one of the dances. The only thing that I would wait on is the sleep. We'll save that towards last. Okay, good. Kind of wishing I could spin like this for real life. <laughs> <laughs> right? Would be nice. That one I have.
Okay, now that we've had a little bit, and you notice that when you do this mirroring game, when anybody can lead, you notice that you really have to be watching everybody, right? Because it's very, very subtle. And the changes might happen from anybody. Okay, so I'm going to tweak it up a little bit. And this game is called, <laughs> this game is called Three Up, Three Down. So the idea is that three people have to be moving and the other three people have to be frozen. Um, so how many people do we have? We have one, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so let's play four up, four down. And I'll go ahead and I'll take myself out of it so you guys can be an even number. Um, so we'll play four up, four down. And four people have to be moving. And again, you can play that mirroring game. So whoever starts a phrase, you know, go ahead and let, let that phrase play out a little bit. Like let it happen for a little while um, before you change it. Um, and then, you know, with that is that, you know, anybody who's in the four moving people can stop and go into a freeze. When that happens, who's ever fro whoever's frozen, one of you has to start moving, right? So does everyone understand the construct of that? Yeah, totally. Yes. Okay, so four up, four down, or four, yeah. four frozen, four moving. Okay, so I'm going to step outside the circle a little bit here, and um, I'll just do a countdown, and at the countdown, four of you will start moving and four of you will stay frozen. You'll just kind of have to pay attention to, like, who actually starts moving and who stops. Okay, so let's go ahead and on the count of three, two, one. Those who are moving, keep moving. If you're going into a frozen mode, make it very clear. Actually, go into one of the freezes. Freeze one, start, or freeze one, two, start. Good, good. Nice. Very nice. Okay, somebody who's been frozen, unfreeze. Let's shake, shake things up a bit. Okay, good, good. All right. Okay, so let's pause for a second. And now let's try doing something in unison, which is always a challenge um, in this environment. Well, I, I guess in any environment. Um, okay, so if you're in a freeze, go ahead and unfreeze. And then let's just try going into D1 together. So go ahead and sort of type it into the chat box so it's ready, but don't press enter yet. <clears throat> and then we'll just do a count, a 3 to one count, and when we do that, then go ahead and, and trigger it. Okay? All right. John, you're frozen. Okay. So on a count of three. I know, I'm trying to oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm slow because I just had to activate everything. Okay. Okay. All right. So you've already typed slash D1 into the chat. And on account of three, two, one, go. Nice. Oh, that was lovely, you guys. Okay, so this time let's try that again. But right after we finish with D1, and you'll see that the last movement is kind of like you're floating in this like lotus position. Um, that sort of signals the end of the gesture phrase. Um, right after that, do the backflip phrase. So again, we're going to do a count of three, two, one to start the D1 phrase, and then go right into backflip. So have that typed into the chat box ready to go. Okay, so slash D1 is in the chat box, and on three. Two, one, go. Okay, get ready for the back flip. Good, good. Okay, so let's do this. Because there's sort of quite a few of us, um, I want to just split us into sort of team one and team two. Okay, so let's split into, let's see, um, uh, Emreen, Cherry, Kim, and Brooke in the first group, and then uh, Destinia, Devin, Christina, and I will go in the next group. So let's have you guys up first, doing just the mirroring game. And you can just go ahead and start, like we'll just, the four of us will kind of step back a little bit into the audience. Okay, oops, I'm going the wrong way, okay. Okay, so go ahead and initiate the mirroring game, and again, um, this is just the simple mirroring game, you're just trying to pay attention to who's the leader in this, and then passing the leadership on to the next person. And John, I see that you're just logged in now, so we have just team one doing the mirroring game, and then we're going to have team two do the mirroring game. Okay, someone, someone take the lead.
Okay, good, you guys. All right, so let's go ahead and um, wrap it up. Well, Cherry's going to keep going with it. Um, I just want to also, maybe this reminder too, um, let's have team two go up. Um, and just a reminder about kind of your view. Uh, it, just in case you kind of get lost in the view, if you like have zoomed in too much or zoomed out too much, you can always reset your view by doing escape twice. Just hitting the escape button on your keyboard twice. And then also using the camera controls button down at the bottom menu, which will allow you to pan and zoom in and zoom out and all this other good stuff. Okay. All right, so team one, go ahead and move towards the audience seating and we'll have team two up. Sorry for taking lead, guys. Whoever wants to do it, it's fine. It's fine. It's meant to be, you know, whoever takes the lead, takes the lead. It's fine. It's meant to be that way. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, team two, go ahead and, oh wait, let me unfreeze myself. Team two, come back on up, or team one, come back on up. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit about um, what you guys saw in the different teams, like what kinds of interactions you saw. Okay, bye Brooke. It's all. It's always hard because you can't. Sometimes you can't type as fast as you, 
see things happening. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that is part of the challenge of it. Yeah. <laughs> Another challenge I Mine found too is that if, if you're in okay. something and you type something else because you forgot what you were in, when you stop the one thing, you might still be in the one you did before. Yeah. And I couldn't uh -huh. remember which one I was in. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. It was usually either jelly or something like that. Or, yeah, you're you know, a freeze, and you go back to that freeze. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. What about when two things were happening at the same time? Like, what if I started, you know, jelly, and you started matrix or something? It took me a little bit of time to realize, if I didn't see you at first, it took me a little bit of time to figure out which movement it was, especially if you were, like, in the middle of it. Yeah, so. but I mean, if two things are going on at one time, like, what did you see happening? Like, some people went with one, and some people went with the other? Yeah, right. that just happened right. in our group right now. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It takes, like, a minute, and then it's it's funny, like, I mean, at least I was, like, I stopped and paused, and I was, like, okay, like, it's very much a follow the leader exercise, where mm -hmm. you're, like, mm -hmm. okay, well, let's see if we go back to neutral, or are we all going to pick pick which one dominates, you know? Another thing that's tough um, is some of them that have some of the same similar movements, like kata or uh, one of the dances. You kind of have to be familiar already with the gestures. Yeah. Or the yeah. phrases, even. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Another thing that sort of was happening, and we'll do like one, one last thing if you guys have a few more minutes. Um, and if you have to bow, you can, you, you can do that too. Um, I think also, like in addition to sort of like seeing what ended up being like truly like the, the quote unquote, like the leading movement, you know, to sort of like whoever ended up swarming with that movement ended up, you know, you went with that movement. And, you know, that ends up happening, you know, even if it is a small or a large group. Um, I think also that, oh, I just lost my thought. What was it? Oh, I can't remember you know what it was. Go ahead. You know what's funny in the large group, too, is you could kind of tell when there were conflicting moments. Mm -hmm. the, the sillier of the ones or the ones that are, quote, unquote, more fun definitely went out. Like, if somebody's going to do jelly, everybody's going to do jelly. You know right, what I mean? right, yeah. Like, yeah. Just interesting yeah. to watch it happen. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's also very recognizable, too, you know, so it's like, okay, you know, like, everyone knows what jelly is, or everyone knows what matrix is, um, you know, also jelly, because it's looped, so it's easy to kind of do and just not have to worry about. Um, I think there were also some interesting uh, moments where people didn't know exactly, like, when to pick up and lead, or when to, you know, and that might have been just a, like, just an instance of, you know, not typing fast enough or also just like sort of seeing, um, like try, like seeing who would go first. There was like, I felt like there's moments where people were like waiting to see who would go. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Because you don't yeah. have the, uh, the, like the eye contact thing. You don't get to say like, you go, no, you go, no, you go. Like you don't really get to have that. You just have to guess. So, yeah, but yeah, there's sort of a natural give and take to that, too, I think, that, um, yeah. you know, like, you just have to kind of trust that somebody will go. Somebody's going to go. Right? Yeah, somebody will go, you know, and even, so here's a question, too, like, if you can't see me, but, you know, I'm sort of whatever, like, I've taken the lead, you know, maybe I'm the lead in the mirroring game, but you can't see me, how can you know what to do? Exactly. So even if I, if you can't see me, somebody next to you might be able to. Similarly, like, let's say, you know, if you were leading and I couldn't see you, maybe because you were in the back of the room or in a different space or whatever, like, I know that somebody next to you and that somebody next to them might be seeing you. So it's a question, too, of just, like, being aware of who else is in the space, you know? So last but not least, let's go ahead and put on some body objects. So go ahead and open up your inventory, Control-I or Command-I. And put on a ring. 
And it can be any ring, like, um, you know, one of the half rings. Okay, and then put on a left arm, like it might say cone orange left arm or cone um, purple left arm. So we'll put on a left arm and a right leg. Okay, so you should have something on your left arm and your right leg. I can't find my, oh, here they are. Sorry. They're probably in the objects folder. Sorry about that. And you're just going to double click to put them on. I think somebody dropped their, does everyone have, yeah, a ring and a left arm and a right leg. Yeah, good, great. Okay. So, okay, so the way that we'll work this last game is that everyone starts off with their objects on them. And again, we're playing the mirroring game. We're just going to keep it simple. We'll play the mirroring game. You know, so somebody can start and other people, you know, jump in and somebody else takes over, just like we've been doing. However, at some point during the time, somebody drops their ring, removes it. So you can remove it just by double-clicking it in the inventory again. Um, so the first thing that might come off, and we don't know when it'll happen, but it will be the ring, and somebody can do that. And then once once somebody one person does it, everyone else has to take their rings off. Okay, and then one of the arms or one of the legs can come off, right? So it gradually, an arm comes off or a leg beam comes off, you know. And once somebody sees that, everyone has to drop that arm object or everyone has to drop that leg object. Okay, until we don't have any of the body objects left. We don't have the ring or the arm or the leg objects. And then once that happens, once there's no objects on anybody, we fall asleep. So you go into that sleep pose. Okay? All right, so let's go ahead and start. It's helpful at this point, I feel like with all these things on and stuff going on, is I like to kind of zoom out a little bit, use my camera controls to just like see the whole space.
Okay, good, you guys. Alright, so, um, how do you guys feel about how that went? That's pretty cool. That was way more difficult, though, than when we did it during office hours on Sunday. <laughs> it was, um, and why do you think that was? Because it's, I don't well, think that there's, people. there is more people, because I think we only had four, mm -hmm. we had four people. Five total. Right. Yeah. Um, but it's only actually, it's only two more people than we had before. Uh -huh. So it's interesting that it did seem much more challenging, but there was only two more people. Um, but there was a lot more to watch, I think. Yeah, I mean, two people, surprisingly, a lot of. Uh, body objects, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was a lot of sort of going on with the body objects. Yeah, um, a few people forgot their body objects. Um, yeah, yeah. And you do have to sort of stay. It's interesting. You have to stay sort of in it's this sort of a zoomed out view um, to see everything with all of body objects, and yet pay attention still to the individual movements. Yeah, there was good spacing. Everyone like, used the space really well. You can just use the camera controls to zoom out. The camera controls button down at the bottom. Yeah, you can pan and zoom in and zoom out. And that way, you can also, one of the easier ways to zoom in and out is just to use the Option or Alt button on your keyboard and click on something. Like if I wanted to, you know, click on, like, what's it, like, look at Christina, for instance. I can hit the Alt or the Option button, which turns into a magnifying glass, and I can zoom in and out that way. You can go ahead and try that. So that's a keyboard shortcut that's very useful. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. You can use the option key and arrows. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So there, there is a lot to watch. Um, what I like about layering on that game, because you know, it starts off as a very simple, just like let's mirror each other game. But then you add objects. You can add more dance phrases, and it gets much more complicated. And then you end up having to really, really listen more carefully. Um, I mean, and by listen, I mean, obviously listen to each other, you know, so in this, in this space, you know, <laughs> um, so, um, but I think it's exactly the same thing that happens in a jazz improv, you know, where if, for those of you that like jazz or that, you know, do um, music improv is that you're basically just watching for signs of change, um, and seeing like where somebody's riff takes them and, you know, oh, somebody's changing it up. Let me listen and adjust to that. So I feel like there's a same element of um, having to be very attentive to each other and that even though we don't have the benefit of seeing like sort of facial expressions and things, um, we do have the option of zooming in and out, you know, in a way that we couldn't in sort of physical space. You know, we can orbit around people, you know, we can use the camera controls, you know, so we have like a little bit of a different kind of control around the space um, in order to see kind of what's happening. But, you know, again, I feel like it's all about kind of understanding the affordances of the space and the platform. And like John mentioned before, like the fact that we have avatars that are very customizable and that, you know, are very flexible and very, you know, are, we aren't subject to gravity and, you know, things like this. So, um, 
when it comes to like this versus say Google Hangout, I would say that they're just, again, apples versus oranges. They're just completely different kinds of experiences, you know? Um, and that understanding, you know, each kind of experience kind of helps us to leverage whatever it is in that service or platform, you know, that makes it work, you know? So, you know, if I wanted to see somebody's like kind of physical space, I wouldn't use Second Life, I would use Google Hangout. But if I wanted to like, you know, um, build something together and collaborate by actually like building, you know, whatever, an object, a dance phrase, a theater, like this, this stage here, you know, together, then I was, you would use something like this. So, um, I think it's very much about, you know, building towards the experience you're going for. Um, the, it probably, whenever you type something into the chat box or into IM, there's a, a keyboard animation. Uh, so that probably is what you're referring to for like playing the piano. Okay, so um, does anybody have any last questions for about uh, what we did or for John? Oh, I just want to uh, I, I want to apologize for crashing. I crashed twice yeah. and then. Like I've got a severe lag. That's why I'm like bumping into people and doing weird things. But um, I'm normally not like that. <laughs> you know, it happens. I figured. You know, when you when you logged out and in a couple of times, I was like, oh, he's having crashing issues. <laughs> we learned a lot about technology this week. I was great up to then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I feel like it's you know to some degree you you know whenever you're dealing with um platforms and tech like this like you know crashes are going to happen road bumps are going to happen if you get frustrated whenever you hit a road bump you're going to be really frustrated all the time you know so to some degree you just need to relax and let it roll right off your back totally agree <laughs> you know. exactly okay you bye know cherry <laughs> bye kim <laughs> okay it was good seeing you all <laughs> yeah that was fun I, it was good meeting you John thanks for popping in yeah John thanks for introducing us to your work it's really really interesting and it's totally something we haven't looked at yet so thank you great oh you're welcome thank you it was my pleasure yeah I think I have to go too I've got fam I've got my family is sitting around with me like hungry birds with their mouths open. It's time for dinner. Okay. Okay. Good seeing you. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Okay. All you guys, everyone take care. Thank you okay. so much. Okay. Okay, you take Thank care. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.